What a great night. I'm so excited. Hello, everybody. My name is Janice Folk Dawson. My pronouns are she and her. I'm the Executive Vice President of the Ontario Federation of Labour. I'm beyond thrilled to be co-hosting this conference, starting with the exceptional Noam Chomsky and the powerful Ariel Deranger. I wanna to start today by acknowledging that I'm a settler zooming in from the traditional territories of the Attawandaran, the Haudenosaunee, and the treaty lands of the Mississauga of the Credit. This territory is covered by the Upper Canada Treaty number three. When we begin discussions recognizing the traditional territory we are on, we are confirming and must recognize indigenous people are suffering more because of their deep connection to the land and their series of traumatic colonial invasions they have and continue to experience. Indigenous voices, knowledge, needs, solutions, and strategies must be front and center and end of the gather gatherings or discussions labor has confronting the climate crisis. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce my co-MC, Michelle Johnson president of the Society of United Professionals, which represents more than 8,000 Ontario professional workers. A proud Métis woman from Timmins, Ontario, Michelle has burst through the glass ceiling through her more than 30 years in provincial hydro sector. Prior to becoming society's president in 2021, Michelle served as the union's secretary treasurer and the executive vice president of policies. Welcome, Michelle. Thanks, Janice. Hello, everybody. As Janice said, my name is Michelle Johnston. I'm the president of the Society of United Professionals, and I'm thrilled to be co emceeing this event with Janice. I come to you today from the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of Scugog Island First Nation, which is now home to many First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples. The territory is covered by the Upper Canada Treaties. Before we begin our formal agenda tonight, I'm going to review our equality safe space statement. The Ontario Federation of Labour is committed to providing an inclusive, positive environment at all Federation activities and ensuring that all individuals are treated with respect and dignity. We will not tolerate hateful messages from attendees that are racist, sexist, homophobic, transphobic, or ableist, nor any language that is discriminatory or violent in its intent. As such, we reserve the right to expel any attendees from our event that contribute to this type of behavior. The OFL's policies and practices must reflect our collective commitment to equality. Our work must demonstrate that all persons deserve dignity, equality, and respect. Now, I'm going to pass it over to Patty Coates, President of the Ontario Federation, to get us started. Over to you, Patty. Thank you, Michelle. Good evening, everyone. And as Michelle said, my name is Patty Coates. I use the pronoun she and her, and I'm the President of the Ontario Federation of Labour. I am joining you today from the traditional land of the Anishinaabe people. The Anishinaabe include the Ojibwe, Ottawa, and Potawatomi nations, collectively known as the Council of Three Fires. These lands are covered under Treaty 18, which is the Nottawasaga Purchase, which was signed October 17, 1818. I am so excited to welcome you all here tonight as we kick off our Labour Confronts the Climate Crisis Conference. We all know that there is a climate emergency. We are witnessing the devastation caused by worsening forest fires, intense heat waves, rising sea levels, and more. This crisis is wreaking havoc on people's livelihoods and communities. It is impacting health and well-being, causing increased uncertainty, and it's affecting workers. But as workers, we know that when we join together, we are a powerful force. We have a history of being on the front line of struggles for social justice and human rights, and this struggle is no different. As a labor movement, we can play a leading role in confronting this climate crisis by supporting mobilization efforts and advocating for the changes 
that are urgently needed to create a better future for everyone. And that is what we are here to do. Tonight and tomorrow, you will hear from a line of brilliant speakers about the critical role that labor must play in addressing the climate crisis. You will hear about the science, what's at stake, and where pensions fit in. Through keynote addresses, Q&A periods, and a panel discussion, we will address the role of pensions in working towards environmental justice, and whether large public sector pension funds have a role to play in the transition to a green economy. It is also integral that we are having these conversations within the framework of the role that colonialization has played in the climate emergency. Now, we open tonight with a land acknowledgement, and I shared with you the land that I am joining you from as I began my remarks. And it's important that these acknowledgements are not seen as separate from the topic, topics we will be discussing tonight and tomorrow. The destruction we are facing is many years in the making, and it is part of the project of colonialization. This weekend, and always, we do this work in solidarity with First Nations, Métis, and Inuit communities who have been at the forefront of organizing for environmental justice. The challenge ahead is monumental, but I know we have the tools to confront it, and we are here this weekend to learn even more about those tools. By focusing on the role of pensions in working towards environmental justice, I hope you will gain greater insight into the ways we, as a labor movement and as workers, can address the climate crisis. I know these conversations about climate action will not stop here, and I look forward to continuing them with you online and on the streets. So I wish each and every one of you a great and wonderful conference. Solidarity. Thanks, Patty. It is now my pleasure and honor to introduce our next speaker, Ariel Saiqui Deranger. Ariel is a Dene Suline woman, member of the Athabasca Chippewan First Nation Treaty 8 territory, and a mother of two. For decades, Ariel worked with her community and other nations to build out one of the largest intersectional keep it in the ground campaigns the International Indigenous Tar Sands Campaign, challenging the expansion of Alberta's tar sands. As part of her role, she brought international recognition to issues in her territory across the globe. In 2015, Ariel worked with local Indigenous organizers to help build out the foundations of Indigenous climate action, becoming one of the co-founders. She formally stepped into the role of executive director in July of 2017, and has been helping to grow the organization and the mission, vision, and values of an indigenous-led climate justice movement in so-called Canada. Ariel has written for The Guardian, Yellowhead Institute, The National Observer, Red Pepper Magazine. She's been featured in documentary films, including Elemental 2012, interviewed for national and international media outlets, including Democracy Now!, Aboriginal People's Television Network, and CBC. Ariel is here to frame the climate crisis from an Indigenous perspective for us today, which is where we should all start from in order, in order to truly confront it. Welcome, Ariel. Over to you. Thank you so much, Iglanite Masicho, Iglanite Denesotlaneta, Ariel Tseekwe Huche, Durange Betsy and Hesli. My name is Ariel Tseekwe Durange, and I, as was I like to start things by grounding who I am because I think it's really important. These are moccasins that were my grandfather's um, that were made 
my grandfather on my maternal side made by my grandmother on my paternal side. And I'm wearing them on the soil of the Northern Territory in Australia where they're fighting fracking. And it really feels like a depiction of who I am. I take my culture and my identity with me wherever I go. And I'm working with other indigenous communities across the globe to challenge, to face and combat one of the biggest challenges we've ever faced in humanity, the climate crisis. But I have my roots in my identity, in my homes. I'm a member of the Athabasca Chippewan First Nation or the Kaitale Dene Sotlane. Kaitale means people of the willow. Dene Sotlane means people of the land. The word Dene when broken down into its root forms means to flow from the land. Our identities are inextricably linked to the places where we come from. This is not simply a place, these are the places that nurtured me as a child, that fed me, that gave me water to drink, food to eat, medicines that were picked. It nurtured my soul through the stories that it told. It nurtured my spirit and my culture and my identity. These come, this knowledge came down and was passed down through intergenerational storytelling that my father had, who taught us to hunt, trap, pick medicines and berries, who taught us that the land is our relation. The terminology, all my relations, is something that is often heard in many of our communities. And it really is a telling of the fact that we see everything on this earth as part of our relations. We are a part of a web of life that exists on this planet. But my community and my people are not entirely unique. Indigenous peoples represent about 5% of the global population or roughly 500 million people worldwide. And they represent over 5,000 distinct groups in over 90 different countries. And Indigenous peoples occupy or use between 22 to 64% of the land surface. And the reason there's such a discrepancy is it depends on which governments you're talking to to determine whether or not they acknowledge the land use of Indigenous peoples. But that's a really important fact to think about because when we look at urban centers, urban centers take up roughly three to 4% of the land. So Indigenous peoples are utilizing a much broader use and spectrum of the ecosystems on the planet. And when we look at this, 80% of the world's biodiversity is within Indigenous lands and territories, and 85% of the world's protected and conservation areas are within or adjacent to Indigenous lands and territories. This is not an accident. This comes from the very nature that Indigenous peoples have ingrained in their identities, like the Kaitale Dene Sotlane, to all of the different tribes and nations throughout Turtle Island, throughout the Americas, and throughout the world. We have an intrinsic relationship and a deep connection to the places where we come from. We see them as our relatives and as something that we need to care for, not extract and exploit for gain. And this becomes critically important when we start to think about climate change, because Indigenous peoples wield an enormous influence over the well-being of the natural resources on which we depend. We manage 80% of the world's land surface and are de facto guardians of the planet's biodiversity, which is critical to achieving our sustainable development goals that are part and parcel to addressing the climate crisis. Furthermore, it's been estimated that Indigenous lands and protected areas contain over 312 billion tons of carbon, meaning we're sequestering massive amounts of carbon from the atmosphere to ensure that the climate stays stable. If this is taken out of our hands, what happens is the big question. But we have to understand the unique rights of our communities. The reality is, is Indigenous peoples have unique rights that have been affirmed by the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which was signed in 2008. And within that, it states that Indigenous peoples have the right to participate in decision in decision making in matters that would affect their rights and that representatives can be chosen by themselves in accordance with their own procedures and our own decision making institutions. And this is very critical to when we're looking at how this country, Canada, is being developed. We all know that there were treaties signed in this country. A lot of folks mentioned them today. But when we looked at the actual treaties of this country, we have to start breaking it down. You look at the country, and here's a map of all the different treaty regions. But if you look at the yellowed regions of this map, you'll notice that there are no treaties to designate these areas because these areas remain untreated, which is actually a violation of one of the founding treaties, the Royal Proclamation of 1762, which stated that no land would be taken up 
without a treaty or an agreement, which has led to a lot of upheaval in this country. But let's let's just ignore that for a minute. We look at this treaty map and we think, wow, I come from Treaty 8. It's the largest contiguous air treaty area in the country. But when you look at what the government actually states as we have control and say over, it is actually 0.2% of Canada is under the control and jurisdiction of, of First Nations people. The other 99.8 is considered crown land, meaning that the government gets to make the paternalistic decision as to what happens in our lands and territories, which has robbed us of our ability to maintain our roles and responsibilities as stewards over our lands and territories. And this becomes incredibly critical because what we're dealing with is the fact that much of Canada is built upon stolen lands and that this country is a celebration of white supremacy, colonial violence, ongoing land theft, and Indigenous genocide. And what happens when these lands are taken out of the hands of our communities is we see that extractivism takes hold. We see capitalist systems take hold and we see projects like the Alberta tar sands, which is upstream from my community and has wreaked havoc on our ecosystems, our animals and our traditional food systems, our waterways, our air quality, and ultimately our human health. But even further to that, our spiritual and cultural well-being has been severely diminished by the impacts of these projects. And furthermore to that, it's impacting our ability to continue the transmission of traditional and Indigenous knowledge, which has safeguarded 80% of the world's biodiversity, which is critical to climate stabilization. So we need to challenge ourselves. What if we challenged ourselves at looking at this country, not from the colonial borders, but we looked at it from the territories of Indigenous peoples, the original territories of our peoples. What if we looked at the values of these lands that they have for stabilizing our planet as opposed to the eco economics of it? But instead, what we're seeing is Canada's anthropogenic footprint. We look at this map, we see, okay, it seems like these are where all of the major, you know, settlements are in the country close to the border. But then you look at Alberta and we see an obvious thing here that the big stark red blob over the province of Alberta correlates with the industrialization of our lands and territories. And we can start to see where those impacts are. These beautiful lands, of deep carbon sequestration necessary for climate stabilization are being impacted by the push and the drive for, for a sector to extract, to support systems of capitalism that are harming not only the lands and territories, but the lifeways of indigenous communities. And when we start to break that down even more, we start to see how colonialism, systems of patriarchy, capitalism, and white supremacy that are predicated on systems of extractivism have led us to the climate crisis. Within that climate crisis, we have to acknowledge the power that Indigenous peoples have, the role that we play in moving us in the right direction. The, Par the historic Paris Agreement was signed in 2015, well, 2016, but was passed in 2015 at an included decision text with important references to Indigenous peoples' rights that can drive change at the local level where it's needed most. It's been the first international convention since UNDRIP that affirms and recognizes the rights of Indigenous peoples, and that is because of the strength that our knowledge has, that our governance systems have, and that the stewardship of our lands and territories has led to. The vital role of Indigenous peoples was recognized in 2007, yet Indigenous peoples continue to suffer disproportionately, disproportionately high levels of land insecurity, social dislocation, and violence while defending our traditional lands. And we also make up 15% of the world's poorest people. And this is not by accident. This is by design. As Indigenous peoples are stewards of the land, we are yet to be held up as decision makers, as leaders for the climate movement. Instead, we are relegated to movements of protest and opposition to big oil. We were stand up to protect our water, where we stand up against oil and gas structures, where we're asking people to honor our treaties. 
It's in movements like this where I have been so lucky to stand alongside of labor movements, where we've seen the strength that comes from the partnerships with working with our allies that support not just a movement for a climate just future, but a movement that respects the rights of Indigenous peoples, that values us and moves away from that devaluation and the demonization of Indigenous peoples' lifeways. This same movement of protest is, is also being seen at the international levels within the UN, uh, UN Forum Convention on Climate Change or the Conference of the Parties, which is starting in a couple of weeks, where Indigenous peoples, despite the fact that we acknowledge Indigenous peoples within the Paris Agreement, despite the fact that we acknowledge people even in Canada, we say our relationship is so important. We say Indigenous knowledge is so important yet we're relegated to the sign lines and not allowed to make decisions for ourselves. Colonialism remains an ongoing process shaping both the structure and the quality of the relationships between the settler and indigenous peoples. It's time for us to have real truth and reconciliation by recognizing that before we can move forward for a climate justice future, we have to look back and resolve the wrongdoings that have happened. We must move towards decolonization of climate policy, of a just energy future, and what it means to move forward for climate justice. And at, at its root cause, like a lot of people get triggered by decolonization, but decolonization is about the return of and connections to land. It's about returning back to those ideologies of being in relationship, of reciprocity, of harmony. All my relations with the land is a deeply ingrained premise of decolonization. And decolonization is a deconstruction of something to make room for something else. We also have to look back. We have to look back to the strength that Indigenous peoples have had and that pre-colonization, before Columbus came, there were massive trade routes that existed throughout Turtle Island, massive economic routes. There were institutions of education, and it was a beautiful system that is often ignored. And when we talk about climate justice and moving forward to new systems, we also have to acknowledge that there were many systems that existed before the current structures that were not predicated on these capitalistic systems that have robbed many Indigenous peoples and people of color of dignity and being able to have say over what happens in their lives and territories. Within that, we also have to acknowledge that we are modern people. We are not just talking about things from the past, but we are taking that knowledge and we're applying it to modern knowledge and, edu and technologies and systems using solar energy as energy sovereignty in communities where they run on diesel to heat their homes still, where they're not just deal effectively trying to reduce their emissions, but they're trying to achieve justice for their communities. This is my own community, which has built the biggest off-grid solar farm in, in our own community. We also are looking at food security to support food sovereignty, where we're building food centers and community fridges for traditional food sources. We're using GIS technology and mapping to reclaim our lands and territories. Uh, I shared with folks in the chat a native, native land, um, I think it's called nativeland.ca, where you can find out which traditional lands and territories you're on. But we're also using this technology to ensure that we're mapping out our traditional territories, renaming them and reclaiming with our own traditional languages and names. We are seeing this convergence of indigeneity leading the way in monitoring our lands, guarding our lands and territories, leading the climate discourse. And it's critical that we don't just tokenize it, that we actually uplift Indigenous peoples as key decision makers and leaders in the climate justice movement and ensure that we are moving towards economies of justice justice that look at traditional forms of economy as ways to move forward, food systems as traditional food systems, as localized economies that not only uplift the cultures of our community, but address some of the long-standing deficiencies that the Canadian government has put our communities in through holding us in reserve systems, which is a whole other lecture. And this will require us to think about land back, which is such a tricky thing here. Land back is really a movement to 
allow indigenous peoples to have the say over their lands and territories. And this isn't because we want to own the land so that we can control what happens to it, but it's so we can have a say in our territories so that we can uphold the responsibilities that we have as indigenous peoples to care for and steward the lands. And I want to end things. You can read this quote if you'd like, but I really would like to end on reading the definition of climate justice. Because right now what we're seeing is we're in a time of critical change and critical shifts where we're trying to address the climate crisis, where we're talking about divestment movements like pension funds, labor movements. We're talking about the cross sector and intersectional movements to address the climate crisis, but understanding a climate justice framework is critical. Not gonna use that one, sorry, this one. A climate justice framework does not reduce the climate crisis to a puzzle simply focused on carbon accounting. Grassroots community-led movements around the world look across the economy at the exploitation of land, labor, and living systems, at the erosion of seed, soil, story, and spirit, and seek to uplift real solutions around us every day from indigenous traditional knowledge, food sovereignty, decommodification of land, healthcare and housing, to abolishing the military industrial complex seeking to extract the last dredges of fossil fuels from Mother Earth. From just transition and energy democracy for democratized, decentralized, detoxified and decarbonized energies power our lives, to transformative justice where we respond to the violence and trauma with compassion and healing, not policing and punishment and prisons. Climate justice centers organizing, direct action, community-based decision-making by those on the front lines of the crisis who are also at the forefronts of change. In essence, people whose efforts are guided by shared principles and a common vision of restoring our relations with the earth and each other and embracing relationships that cultivate a decolonized worldview of respect, reciprocity, mutuality, and solidarity across all communities and with the rest of the living world and Mother Earth. We must look and ensure that we are not just looking at solutions that continue to uphold systems of colonization, that we're working simultaneously to decolonize and find solutions that are outside of the colonial box, to broaden the solutions so that we can include all of them. And this will absolutely require partnerships with folks in the labor movement so that we can start to value indigenous ways of being indigenous economic systems indigenous energy systems so that we can move towards justice not only for the planet but a justice for all thank you Masi Cho. thank you ariel that was uh, very very powerful uh, presenting the indigenous worldview uh, is the foundation for our discussions on climate crisis uh, has been imperative to this discussion. Thank you so much for that grounding. So I never thought I'd have the opportunity to say this, but now it is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Noam Chomsky. I know many speakers are in awe to have their name listed beside his, and I also feel that same honor as co-host today. He likely needs no introduction for all of our participants, but Noam is one of the most prolific thinkers in modern history. Let's get this right. He is currently the Institute Professor and Professor of Linguistics Hermes at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and the Agnes Nelms Howery Program Chair in Environmental and Social Justice at the University of Arizona. Whew. That that's not all. Considered the founder of modern linguistics, Noam introduced the Chomsky hierarchy, generative grammar, and the concept of universal grammar, which underlies all human speech and is based in the innate structure of the mind. In our labor and political circles, Noam Chomsky is known as a steadfast US political theorist and activist. Lucky for all of us, Nam continues to be an unapologetic critic of both American foreign policy and its ambition for geopolitical dominance and the neoliberal turn of global capitalism, which he identifies in terms of class warfare waged from above against the needs and interests of the greater majority. <laughs> 
Noam is one of the most influential public intellectuals in the world. He has written more than 100 books and continues to make a profound impact in the field of politics and linguistics. Noam is here because in his words, organized labor has historically been in the forefront of struggles for social justice and human welfare. The topic of this conference is the most significant in human history, literally a matter of survival. If humans are to prevail, the labor movement must lead a, play, a leading role. Wow, welcome Nam. We can't wait to hear your insight. Thank you very much. Uh, human beings are a recent arrival on earth two to 300,000 years ago. That's an eye blink in evolutionary time. We're a very unusual species. La language, thought are unique to humans beyond the barest rudiments. Uh, no other species can come anywhere near what we're doing right now. Nevertheless, for all, almost all of human history, people lived in harmony with nature. Indigenous societies still do. They are in fact in the forefront of the bitter, urgent struggle to save us from our folly. First Nations in Canada, Indians in the Amazon, seeking to save this precious resource from destruction, are much the same throughout the world. The Industrial Revolution brought about a qualitative change. Huge progress, great achievements, progressive destruction of the fragile environment that sustains life, accelerating in recent years. We're now approaching a moment when we have to decide whether the human experiment will persist and flourish or whether it will soon approach an inglorious end. And we have to decide soon, that's no exaggeration. Our current circumstances are captured with clarity by Raymond Pierre Humbert, Oxford professor of physics, one of the authors of the regular IPPC reports that present the most authoritative accounts of the state of the environment. Notice these are consensus reports. So they tend, if anything, to err on the side of the conservative, less alarmist side. Well, here Humbert's summary and his words. Let's get this on the table right away without mincing words. With regard to the climate crisis, yes, it's time to panic. We are in deep trouble there is no plan B. We must move to zero net carbon emissions and fast. He gives the year 2050, the IPCC cons consensus. Well, that I'm quoting him from 2018. The situation is now far more dire. That's spelled out in the latest IPCC report. August 9th, by gruesome coincidence, the anniversary of the atomic bombing of Nagasaki, which apart from its horrors, confirmed that human intelligence had risen or perhaps descended to the level where it could look forward to quickly destroying life on Earth. It's a much more efficient mode of species destruction than slow suicide through destroying the environment. And it's another threat that's a dire threat that's increasing right now. Well, the latest 
IPPC report is even more grim than its predecessors. I'll return to it a moment, to, to it in a moment, and also to the international reaction of those who, the origins of the capitalist era, state capitalist era, in those days, Adam Smith, uh, the people who he, Adam Smith called the masters of mankind. In his day, they were the merchants and manufacturers of England. In our day, multinational corporations, financial institutions, other concentrations of private power, and the governments that in no small measure are at their service. Come back to that, but first a few thoughts on something that sounds more remote, but ominously may not be. You probably know about the Fermi paradox as posed by the great physicist Enrico Fermi. In brief, the paradox is, where are they? His discipline of astrophysics demonstrates that there are a vast number of planets accessible to us, all with conditions similar enough on Earth so that they should be able to support life over time, intelligent life, maybe super intelligent life. So where are they? With the most diligent search, we cannot find the slightest hint of their existence. Well, one answer that's been offered in a morbid jest is that they're out there but when they came across humans, they decided to get away from that crazy place as quickly as possible. We're certainly providing evidence for that. There's another answer in the same vein, but in this case, quite serious. The answer, the suggested answer is that intelligent life developed many, many times, but it proved to be a lethal mutation and it quickly destroyed itself. Well, we know of only one case, humans on Earth. As I mentioned, we were a very recent arrival on Earth, and we seem to be intent on establishing the thesis that higher intelligence will quickly lead to self-destruction. That's been clear enough for almost 80 years, since those grim days in August 1945, when we learned that human intelligence had devised the means for self-annihilation. Not quite yet, but it was clear that that day was not far off. It actually came a few years later in 1953, when the United States and the Soviet Union exploded thermonuclear weapons, which can indeed destroy everything. Well, in acknowledgement of this achievement of human intelligence, the hands of the famous doomsday clock, which encapsulates the world security situation, uh, the hands were advanced to two minutes to midnight. Midnight means termination. The hands have oscillated since. They did not reach two minutes to midnight again until halfway through the Trump administration. In its final years, the analysts abandoned the minutes and shifted to seconds. The latest report, we are at 100 seconds to midnight. We are currently facing a confluence of uh, very severe crises. To each of them, we know of feasible solutions, well within reach. In each case, we are rejecting the solutions and racing to the precipice, some of us more rapidly than others. 
to be more precise, it is not we who are racing to the precipice. Rather, it's Adam Smith's Masters of Mankind, the great concentrations of private economic power and the governments that serve their interests. There's nothing new about the phenomenon. Going back to Adam Smith, the origins of industrial state capitalism, he observed that the masters are the principal architects of government <laughs> policy, and they use their power to ensure that their own interests are most peculiarly attended to, no matter how grievous the effects on others, including the people of England, but in particular, the victims of what he called the savage injustice of the Europeans. He was focusing particularly on England's murderous depredations in India. He also informed us correctly that the masters of mankind pursue what he called their vile maxim, all for ourselves, nothing for anyone else. Well, if that sounds familiar, it's because it is. The masters are basically vulgar Marxists, values reversed, constantly fighting a bitter class war, a commitment that's built in to the nature of the institutions of state capitalism. And on the matter of service to state authorities, to the masters, evidence is compelling. Critically important illustrative cases are regularly on the front pages, right now, in fact. As you know, the US Congress is now debating a major program which among other things, may be the last chance for the United States to take secret serious steps to arrest catastrophic global warming. Its fate is largely in the hands of the chairman of the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee, who happens to be the champion of the Congress in receiving funds from fossil fuel industries. That's actually quite a feat considering the scale of bribery of Congress by the fossil fuel industries. He's now demanding sole jurisdiction in the Senate over the $150 billion clean electricity program. His name, as you've heard, is Joe Manchin of West Virginia. He can get what he wants. The Senate is split. The Republicans are 100% opposed to dealing with the climate crisis. The fate of legislation rests on unity among Democrats. The chief recipient of fossil fuel funding, a Democrat, can ensure that nothing will be done to harm his donors. He has an official position. Innovation, but no elimination. No elimination of fossil fuels. That's straight from the playbook of ExxonMobil, Chevron, and the rest. We must be free to keep pouring poisons into the atmosphere and maybe someday some technology will be devised that can get rid of some of them, by which time we may well have fallen off the precipice. But short-term profits for the very rich come first. It's the vile maxim. Well, if the denialist party returns to power next year, in the United States, as it may, we will be 
racing to the abyss as quickly as possible, picking up from the disastrous Trump years. And what the most powerful state in world history does has an enormous effect on the rest of the world. Well, it may seem that this is an aberration, just one case. It's not. A revealing example, in fact, is the climate denialism of the Republican Party. Where did it come from? Turns out that their shift to total commitment to cataclysm also results from the power of the fossil fuel industry, which incidentally receives $11 million in subsidies every minute, according to a recent IMF study. Goes far back, the Kyoto Protocols of 1997 were signed by 191 countries. If they'd been implemented, the task of dealing with the crisis would have been far easier. The Republican Congress blocked ratification. George W. Bush withdrew the United States from the protocols as soon as he took office, followed by the Harper government a few years later. In 2008, there were signs that the Republicans were veering towards recognizing that we are destroying the prospects for survival of organized life on earth and harming short-term profits for the masters. That aroused concerns. The Koch brothers energy conglomerate had been working for years to keep the poor party on its denialist course. They immediately launched a huge juggernaut. Bribery, threats, lobbying, fake astroturf, popular organizations, the whole routine. The party quickly capitulated and returned to strict denialism. There are major effects. 2015, the Paris agreements uh, led to decisions of the first major decisions about mitigating the climate crisis. Notice it's an agreement, not a treaty. The organizers in France hoped and intended to establish a treaty with verifiable commitments. There was a barrier. The Republican Party would re refuse to consider any treaty. So it's voluntary agreement, voluntary commitments, which of course are not met. Right now, they are blocking. Trump, of course, pulled out of the treaty of the agreement completely. Now they're blocking every effort to deter the impending cataclysm following the orders of the masters. And that's not an operation either. Research in mainstream academic political science has demonstrated a remarkably close correlation between electability and strategic business-based campaign funding. And it has also demonstrated the immediate corollary of that. A large majority of voters in the United States are unrepresented. Their own representatives are listening to different voices, as they must if they hope to be reelected. A blocking of legislation that would harm the fossil fuel industry is not a malady specific to the United States. Let's consider what's happening right now around the world. As we meet, governments of the world are pressuring oil producers to increase production, having just been advised in the August IPPC report 
that catastrophe is looming unless we begin immediately to reduce fossil fuel year by year, effectively phasing it out by mid-century. Take a look at petroleum industry journals. They're euphoric about the discovery of new fields to exploit as demand for oil increases. The business press is debating whether the US fracking industry or OPEC is best placed to increase production. And you can readily add examples from where you're sitting. All of them know that they are racing to catastrophe. Furthermore, at least if they are literate, they all know that there are feasible solutions to the climate crisis, which will furthermore create a more livable world. But profit for the rich and political expediency come first. That's for the masters and their servants. What about the general population? Oh, that's a interesting story. So take Joe Manchin's West Virginia. It's a coal mining state, which not too many years ago was a bastion of working class militancy. The United Mine Workers has recently adopted a transition program that would shift production towards renewable energy with better jobs and better lives, all feasible. But these are people, not their bitter enemy in the relentless one-sided class war conducted by the masters with increasing intensity in the past 40 years of the neoliberal assault on the population. That merits a few words. In the 1930s, which happens to be my childhood, remember it well, the world was facing very serious crises. There were several ways out. Continental Europe turned to fascism. In the United States, a rising militant working class and a sympathetic president turned to social democracy. Post-war Europe moved in the same direction. That led to what economists call the golden age of capitalism in the United States. Come back to that. The business world resisted, but in, until the 1970s, it was unable to reverse the course. By the late 1970s, the business offensive was making progress. In 1978, UAW, United Auto Workers President, Doug Fraser, pulled out of a labor management conference established by President Carter, who was quite anti-labor. Fraser pulled out, he condemned business leaders, I'm quoting him, he condemned business leaders for having chosen to wage a one-sided class war in this country, a war against working people, the unemployed, the poor, the minorities, the very young and the very old, and many in the middle class of our society, and having broken and discarded a fragile, unwritten compact previously existing during a period of growth and progress, the New Deal years the golden age. One might comment that his recognition of this was a little belated, but it was recognition. Well, then came Reagan Thatcher and the one-sided class war took off full steam. Their first acts, as you recall, were to smash unions using illegal methods opening the door to the corporate sector to follow suit. Illegal, but if you have a criminal state, it doesn't matter. 
It was imperative, they understood, imperative to deprive working people of the main means of defense against what was being planned. And for those with eyes open, what was to come was never in doubt, was made very clear at the outset. So take a look back to Reagan's inaugural address. Centerpiece was governments are not the, are the problem, not the solution. That the government, if it if decisions are taken out of the hands of government, they don't disappear. They move somewhere else. Where? To private hands, to the hands of concentrated private capital. Government is somewhat responsive to public opinion in the eyes of the masters, that's a flaw. Private capital, concentrated private capital, is totally unaccountable. And that was made very explicit at the time by the economic guru of the neoliberal assault, Milton Friedman, wrote an important article in which he said that corporations have no responsibility at all nothing to the public, uh, their only responsibility is to maximize profit. And of course, uh, salaries for, for management and CEO. Well, incorporation is a gift from the public. You incorporate, you get a lot of advantages. You don't want the gift, you can stay a partnership. But according to the neoliberal dogma, you take the gift, but it comes with no responsibilities. Well, it's not hard to predict what's gonna happen from that. And in fact, we actually have some measures of it recently. The couple months ago, the highly respectable quasi-governmental RAND Corporation did a study of the transfer of wealth, more accurately, robbery, the transfer of wealth from the working class and the middle class, lower 90% of the population in income, transfer of wealth from them to the very top, top 1%, actually fraction of 1% if you look. Their estimate over 45 years is roughly $50 trillion. It's not small pennies. And that's a big underestimate. They didn't look at other things. They didn't look at the options that were opened up by Reagan when he followed the orders of the master with precision, uh, tax havens, shell companies, lots of other devices which have stolen another tens of trillions of dollars from the population. Meanwhile, the top 1% doubled their share of wealth from 10% to 20%. And that's actually a fraction of 1% of the population. The ratio of CEO salaries to wages increased tenfold, factor of 10. Majority of the population lives from paycheck to paycheck. Real, real male, male wages are about what they were in 1979, before the assault began. Uh, it's uh, the majority of the population, as I say, lives from basically from paycheck to paycheck. It's a precarious existence. Many workers live under conditions of extreme uncertainty. I mean, services are cut back. They were already limited by comparative standards. That's a rough, picture of the neoliberal assault. Well, there is a standard definition it says that neoliberalism calls for reliance on markets. That's half true. The right definition of neoliberalism is relentless, one-sided class war. No markets. The economy is what left economists rightly call a bailout economy. 
deregulation of the vastly growing financial institutions, of course, leads to financial crises, each one more serious than the last. As soon as there's a financial crisis, the perpetrators are bailed out by the friendly taxpayer. And that's the least of it. The business world understands that there is an implicit government insurance policy that has a name, too big to fail. You get in trouble, taxpayer bails you out. That has many consequences. It means that uh, businesses have uh, higher credit ratings, because big ones at least, they're not going to collapse. That means access to cheap credit. It means the opportunity to take risky uh, initiatives, highly profitable. They don't work, doesn't matter. They're bailed out. Uh, the IMF actually did a study a couple of years ago of the major US banks and concluded that virtually their entire profits trace back to the implicit government insurance policy. Uh, one clear striking example of this was under President Obama. You recall there was a TARP legislation to bail out the economy after the financial crisis, which resulted from a real estate crisis caused by predatory loans, cheating, robbery of the public, finally crashed. The TARP legislation had two parts. One part was to bail out the perpetrators, Citigroup, the other banks who had made the predatory loans, knowing, of course, that they would collapse. So you had to bail them out and the major insurance companies which were in trouble. The other half of the legislation was support for the people who had suffered, whose homes were closed, sold under foreclosure, lost their jobs, so some help for them. Well, anyone who understands the vile maxim will be able to guess which half was pursued by the Obama administration. Actually, the the inspector general of the treasury department was so outraged he wrote an angry book about it which led to the usual spot for critical work well the obama sellout of working people is the prelude to rome to donald trump the republicans didn't win the working class the democrats handed it to them on a platter. Well, work, as far as markets are concerned, working people and the poor are to suffer the ravages of the market. Isolated, no defense. The masters have to be protected by a powerful state. The same is true of the radically protectionist arrangements that are ludicrously called free trade agreements. They're suffering from that right now. Well, uh, the huge drug prices caused by a government granted monopoly or one example of this, that was Reagan. Same was true of Thatcher. Like Reagan destroyed the unions, first act. Her mantra was, there is no society. You survive somehow on your own, unless, of course, you're among the masters. Then there's a very rich society, Chamber of Commerce, Business Roundtable, American Legislative Exchange Council, ALEC, which imposes business-friendly programs in state legislatures. These are easily manipulated and bought off. There are trade associations, much more rich society for the rich. The savagery of the vile maxim is illustrated by small details. Take ALEC. There's a major phenomenon in the United States called wage theft. 
billions of dollars are stolen from workers every year by just refusal to pay wages, refusal to pay overtime, or cutting back on wages illegally, and so on. One of Alex's major efforts at the state level is to get the state legislatures to pass laws banning any punishment for wage theft. And that's not enough. Banning any investigation of wage theft. The rich have to be free to rob working people without investigation, let alone punishment. And that's passing through state legislatures around the country. You can see it right now in the, what the Republican Party calls its red lines and the current discussions in Congress about the pending legislation, they've established red lines. No increase in taxation of the rich and the corporate sector, which are historically low. You cannot touch Trump's one legislative achievement, the 2017 tax scam. Huge gift to the rich and the corporate sector, stabbing the rest of the country in the back. The one consequence of it is that for the first time in a century, billionaires pay lower tax rates than steel workers. So one red line is can't touch that. Another red line is you cannot fund the Internal Revenue Service, which investigates robbery by the rich. You can't fund it. So it won't be able to stop the robbery of the massive robbery of the rich. Those are the red lines. The vile maxim raised almost to parody. Uh, meanwhile, the uh, 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 steps are being taken towards a kind of proto-fascism, or maybe all the way. Some analysts argue. Actually, they're very sober and respected voices sounding the alarm about the collapse of American democracy, which will have dire consequences for the world. Among them are the leading commentators of the London Financial Times, world's leading business press, sober, conservative, not given to exaggerations. They warn that the United States is being driven to autocracy by, in their words, a radical party with a reactionary agenda with ranks along, so alongside the far-right European parties with neo-fascist origins. It's a pretty bitter irony for those who have lived through the last century. Again, in the 1930s, my childhood, major crisis, continental Europe moved to fascism, the United States moved to social democracy on a wave of working class militancy. Now it's almost reversed. Europe is somewhat hanging on to the relics of social democracy. US is moving towards fascism. Well, that's a bird's eye view of where I think we are now. It's not graven in stone. Plenty of counterforces. On climate, mainly the young. Terrible indictment of my generation. When Greta Thunberg told the Assembly of the Masters at Davos that you have betrayed us, she was right. The words should be seared into our conscience. It's not too late but we do not have much time to heed those words. Worth remembering that the pioneers in environmentalism were working people. In the early 1970s, when the beginnings of the, of the climate crisis were beginning to be perceived, in the early 70s, there was a significant rise in labor militancy was mostly repressed, not entirely. Tony Mazaki and uh, 
his oil chemical Tomok Workers Union, they became active environmentalists. That's not surprising. They are right on the front line in their lives facing destruction of the environment every day at work. Among other things, the union was the driving popular force behind the establishment of OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Act, protecting workers on the job. And they went on from there. Nozaki, as well as being a committed environmentalist, was a harsh critic of capitalism. He held that, in his words, workers should control the plant environment while also taking the lead in combating industrial pollution, destruction of the environment. As the Democrats abandoned working people during the neoliberal period, Hazaki began to advocate for a union-based labor party. It was an initiative that made considerable progress in the 1990s, couldn't survive the decline of the labor movement under severe business government attack reminiscent of the 1920s. Well, today, as I mentioned, United Mine Workers is moving towards serious climate activism. Same is true in Ohio and California, where unions are moving in the same direction, mining areas, based on a lot of grassroots work. My co-author, Robert Pollan, economist has done some of the major work on the economics of sustainable development, has been doing extensive work with labor activists, others as well. All of this is reminiscent of the 1930s. In the 1920s, the vibrant labor movement had been crushed by state corporate violence. It was revived, as I remember very well. CIO organizing, militant action, sit-down strikes, they're serious. Sit-down strikes strike fear into the hearts of the masters. They can perceive that a sit-down strike is one step before saying, we don't need you. We can run this workplace ourselves. At that point, you had to change. The business world reduced its antagonism to the New Deal, recognized we better agree to something or we're going to be lost. The Supreme Court, which had been killing all New Deal legislation, stopped, began to authorize it. Uh, that's what led to the New Deal, by no means perfect, many flaws, very racist because of the force of Southern Democrats. Uh, not because the liberals wanted it, but had to. A lot of flaws, but it left a lot of very good things for the population. And the business world since has been trying to reverse that. Well, today we're in a situation which is reminiscent of the 30s. We right now are witnessing a huge strike wave, wave an enormous strike wave. Some call it the great strike of, 19, of 2021. What's a strike? A strike is withholding labor. That's exactly what's happening. Huge numbers of people are refusing to go back to the rotten jobs, the low wages, the precarity that was created by the neoliberal assault. That's a major strike involving many millions of people not organized, not unionized, but a major strike, which is frightening the establishment. I understand what's happening. There are other strikes, interestingly, in some of the most Republican states, West Virginia, Arizona, where I live, teacher strikes, teachers striking, not just for better wages, which they badly deserve, but also for decent conditions for children. 
part of the neoliberal assault has been to try to destroy the public education system. Go back to the late 19th century, it was a major contribution of American democracy to general welfare and democracy. Business wants to destroy it. Uh, Milton Friedman, open about it. Let's get rid of the public education system. We just had four years under Trump where the Secretary of Education, Betsy DeVos, was openly committed to destroying the public education system, been radically defunded, uh, things like arts programs, uh, nurses taken away, uh, 50 children in an overcrowded classroom. Uh, that's what teachers are objecting to. They want our children to have decent circumstances, enormously popular in very reactionary circles. Uh, where I live in Tucson, Arizona, you could see signs on lawns all over the town supporting the teachers. And they've, there's a battle going on in the state legislature. There was a referendum calling for increasing funding of the schools. Republican literature, legislature's trying to kill it. Battles going on right now. Well, these things are happening all over. We could be on the verge of a reversal of the savage capitalism of the past 45 years, maybe even moving on to the more humane vision of working people controlling their own enterprises. It was the slogan of 19th century American workers and of the farmers in the Midwest who are organizing to create a cooperative commonwealth free from domination by Northeastern bankers and market managers. The workers and the farmers were close to unifying in these objectives. These are efforts that could have led to a much more free and more just society. The efforts were crushed by state corporate violence, but ideas don't die and they have resonance in our, by now, somewhat different societies. These are thoughts to keep in mind, I think, as a guide to action, as we mobilize to confront the severe crises that might provide a grim answer to Fermi's paradox, showing that higher intelligence does lead to self-destruction bringing much of life on earth down with us. Thank you, Professor Chomsky. That was absolutely uh, incredible. Those considerations for us to percolate uh, and to work through are certainly uh, a good foundation for our uh, next uh, the next day. Um, as you've been talking, there have been questions coming up, and uh, we now will be taking some questions from the audience. Um, you can ask your questions to the panelists via the Q&A feature. Just click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. A pop-up box will open up and you can write your question. Questions will be read out loud and will be answered live um, uh, by the panel. Um, and otherwise, uh, you may be uh, otherwise they may be answered directly in the Q&A box. So if your question doesn't get answered uh, live, uh, we'll still see if we can get it answered in the box. Um, our first question is for Ariel. Uh, Ariel, what can we do to push for a Green New Deal in so-called Canada that prioritizes land back and Indigenous rights while aiming for collective ownership of our sustainable transition? Just a little question, right? Yeah, just a little one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I mean, it's a good question. I think that there have been a lot of attempts to get a Green New Deal going in Canada. 
that does include the respect of Indigenous rights. But I think one of the biggest challenges that's being faced in the Green New Deal and the inclusion of Indigenous rights within those models is the fact that there are still remains fractures between the environmental movement and Indigenous communities. And this comes from a history of uh, pervasive systems of white supremacy within the sort of, um, you know, modern environmental movement. And the fact that that has led to tokenization of Indigenous peoples as opposed to putting them into positions of leadership. I think that there's still some of those those issues that need to be addressed. Um, it, we can't just be like, okay, let's pretend like all this stuff didn't happen and just move together for for the for the world to all come together. The reality is, is we have to address some of the challenges and really address those systems of white supremacy and colonization. We have to approach a Green New Deal from a decolonial perspective, not trying to, you know push in and, and add in Indigenous peoples because it's what we're supposed to do. But instead, we have to make room for the fact that Indigenous peoples in so-called Canada are the original peoples. We should be leading the process of the Green New Deal, not being asked to join in in the 11th hour. Um, and I think once we start to you know, take a step back, I think for, my, for myself, I think the Green New Deal requires us to take a step back, decolonize, make like recognize and make amends to the fact that we have a deep history of colonization and white supremacy and how do we um, redistribute resources redistribute access to power and privilege and begin to build that movement together and i know we're in a rush because you know uh, no one really really address the fact that we don't have a lot of time and that means that people need to be able to know when to step up and when to step back and when it comes to those that have been oppressed and marginalized for a long time, we don't want to be pulled into a camp with other people's um, campaigns. We want to be leading campaigns that work for our communities. And if it doesn't work for communities to join the Green New Deal, people need to be, understand that that's not where our efforts are. For many of our communities, it is about the revitalization, the restoration of the cultures and identities that were ripped away from our communities through residential schools, through the reserve systems, through the Indian Act processes, through the appropriation of our lands and territories. And we have to reconcile all of those issues in order for us to move forward in a space of trust. And once we can do those things, it may mean that we're doing things side by side as opposed to together. And that goes to that two row wampum philosophies of the original treaties. We don't have to be in the same ship but we are in the same river and we are, are, we are moving together in the same direction. And we have to also accept that sometimes indigenous communities may be doing things differently until we find those nexus points of convergence where we can all join the ship together. And it may be a while still, but it doesn't mean that we have to be against each other. It just means we need to work together to ensure that we are all looking at the path in front of us and that we're all moving towards the same goals. Actually, I should mention perhaps that uh, a the, the question is a little bit different in the United States uh, for not pretty reasons. In the United States, the colonists waged a war of extermination, uh, smashing. The first, one of the main reasons for the Revolutionary War was that England, the British, had imposed a restriction on the colonists. It was a royal declaration and proclamation of 1763, which banned the colonists from moving into the territory of the Indian nations. The British didn't, wasn't out of altruism. They just, the British didn't wanna have that problem on their hands, but they did establish a limit, Appalachian mountains, can't go beyond that. Colonists weren't gonna accept that. Certainly not people like George Washington, major land speculator, a man who's known by the Iroquois as the town destroyer because he was launching wars against the Iroquois right during the Revolutionary War. As soon as the British yoke was lifted, the war started. Now, people talk in the United States about the forever wars, which began in 1783 and have never stopped. Uh, the first through the 19th century. Well, I won't give my words. I'll quote 
the intellectual author of Manifest Destiny, uh, John Quincy Adams, uh, responsible for many of the atrocities himself, later president, uh, in his later years when he was reminiscing on this, he lamented what he called the hapless fate of those Native Americans who we are exterminating with such merciless perfidy and violence. That was before the worst atrocities, which were in California. So what's left is, and then there's a long history, which you know better than I do, I don't have to go through it. Uh, the end result is that you don't have the power of the First Nations in Canada. It was bad enough in Canada, but not that bad. So if it, there is a resolution in Congress, important resolution on a Green New Deal initiated by Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Ed Markey, senior senator from Massachusetts, which covers everything that has to be done, but doesn't say much about indigenous rights. And it's because of this, it's not because of lack of concern, it's because of the end result of the wars of extermination. Uh, but your point, of course, is quite accurate. So the next question we have, it's going to be for Professor Chomsky. What can unions and rank and file union members do to force real change in our workplaces, in carbon intensive industries and the economy, and by driving government action to achieve net zero by the IPCC target date? Things can be done at every level. One thing that could be done is to get Congress to pay attention to the resolution that's on the floor. Actually, it's been on the floor since 2019. Casio Cortez just reintroduced it a couple months ago. Nobody wants to talk about it. Republicans, 100% opposed. The right-wing Democrats like Manchin who are mislabeled moderate, they're never going to allow it. Remember the slogan. Only innovation, no elimination, okay? It's going to be a lot of work to get there. Other things can be done right in the workplace. Uh, workers can act in the workplace to insist that their enterprises move towards carbon neutrality. You can do what the mine workers are doing in West Virginia. It's considered one of the most reactionary places in the country. The mine workers themselves are moving towards developing a transition, which will need some government assistance, but trivial as compared the, to the subsidies to the fossil fuel industries, trivial to carry them over the first steps to a better, much better society, sustainable, better jobs, better communities. As I said, the same is happening in Ohio. California, California, 19 unions signed into a program like this, can be done right in the workplace, can be done in other ways. Uh, the major financial institutions, the banks, are confronting what they call reputational risks. That's a fancy way of saying the peasants are coming with the pitchforks. We've got to watch out. It's kind of like the sit-down strikes in the 30s. Unless we react, we're going to be in trouble. The power of private capital is very fragile. The masters rule because people allow it. If they stop allowing it, the game's over. And they understand that. So when the peasants are coming with the pitchforks, they make some small changes. Uh, they become, present themselves as what are called soulful corporations who are now committed to environment, sustainability, and so on. And if you look at this, sometimes there's actually some things happening, like withdrawal of investments. Here, the pension fund issue is critical for the obvious reasons. 
pension funds are withdrawn from polluting industries, fossil fuel industries, that has a big impact. Most of it is just words. It's what's called greenwashing. Uh, no in, no elimination, only innovation. Look how noble we are. We're putting money into non-existent technology, which might someday remove some of the poisons from the atmosphere. So we're soulful corporations. Got to watch for that. A lot of the programs have that greenwashing character. But the, the fact that they have it is the result of popular action. That's forcing them. And that can go all the way from pressure on the masters to getting rid of them. There's no law that says you have to spend your almost entire waking life uh, serving a master. Perfect people in the late 19th century, radical farmers regarded that as a totally intolerable attack on fundamental human rights. It's not that far back in history, you can recover it. I would like to just also add that we're already seeing mobilizations of workers coming together. There is a small group in Alberta called Iron and Earth, which is a worker-led nonprofit that is uh, looking at the mission to empower the fossil fuel industry and indigenous workers to build and implement climate solutions. So when workers do stand up and ask for better, then things shift and change. But the problem is, is like Professor Chomsky was talking about, we live in an economy that is a ransom economy. We're not allowing people to feel as though they have the free will to speak out. We are stuck in this, as you stated, this master and the subservient people sort of framework in our society. But we have all the power, particularly the workers have all the power to shift things, but we have to be able to take the stands. And in history, we've seen it, you know, Chom Professor Chomsky gave really great examples, but there has to be the willingness for folks to start to stand up on mass and demand the changes. And I really truly believe that if we see this within the labor movements, we can start to shift things, not just in the energy systems and structures, but also what in a, for a framework for just transition. So how we move from just talking about indigenous rights and new energy systems to actually implementing those things at the highest level, but that has to come from the people. And the people have so much power, but we have been led to believe that we don't. And I really hope that we can start to see not the shift, just the shift in the energy systems and sectors, but the shifts in the mind frames of individuals and society to break us from the clutches that the predatory capitalism and colonialism has locked us into. I have another question for you too, Ariel, that's come in. What can students do to push for decolonization in curriculum? disinvestment and free tuition? And what can climate justice and labor organizers do to decolonize their organizing and better support frontline indigenous land and water defenders? Again, just a small question. Yeah, I mean, that's a really big question. I think first off, the, we need to make a delineation between decolonization and indigenization because we are seeing a lot of indigenizing of curriculums across universities um, and even in sort of elementary and secondary school level. But there's a difference between indigenizing material and decolonizing it. Indigenizing is, is that idea of including indigenous peoples within a structure. Decolonization requires the deconstruction of, the pulling apart and finding those places of where it oppresses and where it subjugates indigenous peoples and voices and removing them and making room for the indigenous systems and values and ideologies that have been erased and devalued from our structures for hundreds of years since colonization. And that takes much more work than just adding curriculum of, and I'm, I'm not trying to make a dig on you, but than just simply doing a land acknowledgement or in saying the words like we respect indigenous rights. There's a difference between respecting indigenous rights and upholding the frameworks for indigenous peoples to be included as key decision makers. In Canada, we've already seen that the Prime Minister Trudeau has already stated that indigenous peoples do not have veto power 
in frontline resistance movements in the Wet'suwet'en, Site C, Muskrat Falls. We've seen Indigenous peoples try to oppose the industrialization of our Indigenous territories, but it's corporations and the federal government that has the ultimate say. There still remains a paternalistic approach, and that is what needs to be removed. That paternalism of the, of the colonists needs to be removed from our systems and structures. As far as tuition, that's a whole other question, but I feel like we need to be moving towards free education. We need to be moving to decolonial education that uplifts and upholds the values of Indigenous peoples. And one of the most important things about decolonizing education is that who are the experts, right? When we talk about education systems, a traditional land user who has intergenerational knowledge about the lands and territories is probably one of the best biologists and ecologists for that territory. Yet they are deemed, they are given simply many times an honorarium for coming over. How do we decolonize the honorarium? How do we list those people as experts at the same levels of a professorship like Professor Chomsky? How do we treat indigenous knowledge systems at those same levels? That is part of deconstructing and decolonizing our education systems. That's how we get to a place where we start to see that the values of Indigenous peoples is not to commodify things. And when we commodify everything from the lands, the territories, even the air, the carbon in the atmosphere through carbon trading mechanisms, we start to deteriorate those relationships. And even education should not be commodified. We're commodifying individuals based on what they can attain through our educational system. And we need to be moving towards a more just framework that decolonizes those mindsets. And it's gonna take much more work than again, than just land acknowledgements and simply stating we respect indigenous rights. It's much more deep and complex, but the promising thing is I really truly believe that we're moving towards stronger decolonial frameworks where we're seeing more indigenous folks be uplifted into decision-making processes and spaces that we have been robbed of for hundreds and hundreds of years. And that's where we're gonna start to see that deconstruction because when our values go into those spaces, we start to see the head-on like, like head collision. And those head-on collisions are sometimes necessary for us to see where those fractures are. Sometimes we have to get a little uncomfortable in order for us to see real change. Perfect, thanks for that, Ariel. Back over to you, Professor Chomsky. Is the only answer to growing nationalist populism real green internationalism and front-loaded migration? It's a very critical question. If you look at the problems we face today, the urgent ones, they're all international. They have no borders. Uh, global warming, has no borders. Pandemics have no borders. Nuclear weapons have no borders. If there's a nuclear war, everyone suffers, maybe to be destroyed. So we actually face a choice between internationalism and extinction. This is a very live issue right now. Take the two major world economies, United States and China, they have to cooperate. If they don't cooperate, we can say goodbye to each other. If you see what's actually happening, it's an increasing level of confrontation, mostly being pressed by the United States. Chinese are not blameless, but the overwhelming force of it is coming from the United States and its allies who go along. So for example, let's take something just recently happened, quite concrete. It's called AUKUS, the Australia, United Kingdom, a US agreement, which Canada supported to send a fleet of advanced high level nuclear submarines to the waters near China. The imbalance is already extraordinary. A single US submarine can literally at attack almost 200 cities anywhere on the earth with nuclear weapons. That's a single US submarine. 
they're now moving to more advanced ones because that's not enough. But China has four submarines, old submarines, noisy, uh, cooped up, can't even get out of the South China Sea. So we have to send Australia uh, a fleet of new nuclear submarines. Meanwhile, kicking France in the face very openly, telling France and the European Union, here's where you fit in the world we run. France already had a deal with Australia for advanced submarines, but non-nuclear, way more than Australia needs. The US didn't even bother to inform France that we're abrogating the deal. You can read about it in the newspapers. That's where you stand in the world we're creating. You can imagine France didn't like it very much. But uh, uh, the submarine, the pretext for sending them, and in fact for saving, sending naval armadas into the South China Sea, the pretext is we're defending freedom of navigation. Like a lot of what you read from governments and is copied in the press, it's a total lie has nothing to do with freedom of navigation, which is not being threatened in the slightest. What it has to do with is an arcane point of law in the law of the sea, which incidentally the United States hasn't ratified, the only maritime power not to ratify it. When you look at the law of the sea, it has a provision on what are called exclusive economic zones. Every country has an exclusive zone, 200 miles offshore. And the question is, what kinds of activities are permitted in the EZ? China says, no military activities. The United States says, yes, you're allowed to have military activities. Uh, India, incidentally, agrees with China. They vigorously protested recent US military naval activities in their economic zone. Well, is that a, is the way to solve that problem of uh, sending more nuclear submarines, which are highly provocative act, sending a naval armada into the South China Sea, or is the way to solve it negotiations and diplomacy? It's a small point of unsettled law. Well, we see what the United States is doing with support of the United Kingdom, passive support of Canada, not the support of continental Europe, which was kicked in the face. Uh, those are the kinds of things that are happening. They are leading at a moment when we should be moving, must be moving towards cooperation. What we're seeing is moves to escalate crisis. Maybe this supports the answer to Faramir's paradox. Higher intelligence is just inherently suicidal. I don't, wouldn't like to believe that, but uh, we have the opportunity to prove or disprove it. Thank you for that, Professor Chomsky. Ariel, um, I wonder if you could tell us more about indigenous climate action and how labor can ally with ICA and other indigenous led organizations. Yeah, for sure, thanks so much. So Indigenous Climate Action was started in 2015 and we have since grown into a national um, virtual organization. So there are staff across the, across the country from coast to coast and we're getting further into the North. And we focus on building resources to support an indigenous led climate justice movement. We do this through training and education uh, and resources and materials while also amplifying indigenous led solutions on the front lines and within grassroots communities. And so we have a climate change toolkit. We're launching a just transition toolkit. This is all framed from an indigenous worldview perspective and trainings. And we're also stepping our foot into divestment. And I think when it comes to labor movements, this is a really important aspect. We need partners in the labor movement because when we talk about divestment, it's not just about moving our money, but it's about moving our industries and really looking for a just transition. And so this is part of our work. We have a just transition program, a youth program, a decolonizing climate policy program, and then our education and training program. And we do welcome folks to join us um, and check out our website at indigenousclimateaction.com. 
And we are looking for partners and helping us to spread information to our indigenous communities and partners on divestment and just transition movements. And this will require education and training with the labor movements. And we'd love to partner and continue to partner with many allies, uh, including the Ontario Federation of Labor and other labor movements across the country. Thanks for that one, Ariel. Um, back over to you, Professor Chomsky. Can the crisis of climate change be stopped by social democratic political parties within capitalism? The answer to that had better be yes. We don't know. Uh, it's a question of time scales. We would all like to see a different kind of society, more free, more just society. But the time scale for that and the time scale for urgent action are very different. We have to get over the immediate crises. We know how to do it. The means are available. They're feasible. A couple percentage of, of course, domestic product. Nothing by what governments do. Uh, we can do it. Then, meantime, it doesn't mean you stop working for, uh, for longer term change. That makes perfect sense while this is happening to develop collectives, uh, uh, cooperatives, uh, worker-owned enterprises, uh, localism and agriculture, uh, mutual aid groups, all kinds of things. Those are steps towards a much better society, not only the institutions, but even the way they raise consciousness and understanding. As I noticed a couple of the questioners were saying, uh, why do we submit to masters? Which is, uh, it's interesting that if you go back 350 years to the first major work on what's now called political science by David Hume, great philosopher, his foundations of the principles of government, first paragraph, he asks this question. He says, he says he's, astonished, he's amazed by the ease with which people submit to the rule of the few. This is a strange paradox, because power is in the hands of the governed. Why don't they use it? He says, the answer must be opinion. Somehow the masters manage to control opinion and make us believe that nothing's possible. It's what Antonio Gramsci wrote a lot about hegemonic common sense. You just impose a set of beliefs. They look as obvious as you know, the fact that you have to breathe air. Most of them are false. As soon as they're punctured, they collapse. Uh, one of them is the idea that you can't do anything. You're helpless. I feel it's a striking difference between the 1930s and today. I remember the 1930s very well. My family was first generation immigrants, mostly uh, working people, mostly unemployed. Uh, situation was bad, but you know, not, not unlivable. Much worse than today in absolute terms. But it was hopeful. Everyone assumed we can get out of this together. We'll work together, we'll find a way out. I said, labor organizing, labor unions, Labor unions were more than just a job. Like my aunts were seamstresses, unemployed seamstresses in the Hill Group, the International Ladies Garment Workers Union. For them, the union was a cultural center, uh, educational programs, places to meet, work with people, even a couple of weeks in the mountains outside New York. It, it was their life, you know. It was a life, not just a job. Well, all of that, Thatcher and Reagan knew what they were doing when they decided to start the neoliberal assault by undermining the unions. And we, speaking of internationalism, we should remember that many of the unions in their names have the word international. That can be made real. They can cooperate internationally with working people elsewhere. Take what's called 
globalization. It's a particular form of class war. What globalization means is a group of rich bankers in New York get together and decide we can enrich ourselves further if we close a plant in Indiana and send it to Mexico. And then come along the economists and moral philosophers and say, well, it's a good thing because people in Mexico need jobs too. Translate that into English. What they're saying is working people in Indiana should provide charity to working people in Mexico. It's not the only possibility. Another possibility is that if rich bankers in New York are interested in providing charity to Mexican workers, they can do it easily. Raise wages, improve working conditions, level the playing field. That's one of those thoughts that's unthinkable. Look at the literature on globalization. Nobody will mention this. Well, that's David Hume's point. There are, we submit to masters because we accept opinions which there's no reason to accept. And as soon as you expose them to sunlight, they fade. And the task is do that. Make it clear to people you have options. There are lots you can do. You can do anything. We have the fate of the future in our hands. We can move towards a far better society. We, can, we don't have to accept the idea that was regarded as totally degrading in the late 19th century that you have to spend most of your waking life under the service in the service of a master. You don't have to. There's other ways. You can control enterprises yourself. Well, this is absolutely incredible. I think we could go on all night asking questions. I know I have pages and pages of notes, but I think we're just going to take a couple more questions, uh, recognizing the time that it is. And I'm going to ask this question of Ariel. And again, just a small question, Ariel. Uh, for those activists who want to use violence against government, big oil, the police, everyone responsible for climate crisis, what do you have to say to them? When do we, the people fighting for a greener future, use violence to actually protect what little we have left? I think, I think that's a really, really deeply interesting question because it's, it's who is determining the violence and when the violence begins. Because for many indigenous communities on the front line, the violence began with the destruction of our lands and territories. When we see our lands and territories destroyed, it's not simply a place, a river, or a system. Um, I've shared this story in the past, and I and I do. I think I want to share it now to sort of contextualize what I'm going to say. But I, my parents divorced when I was younger, and I spent most of my like second half of my childhood in Southern Saskatchewan away from my traditional territory. And it was in that time that the Alberta tar sands really ramped up production. So I remember seeing the, 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 the factories when I was little, but they were small and they were kind of hidden behind the trees. And then I returned back to my territory when I was about 22. And I remember driving down the road from Fort Mackay or from Fort McMurray to Fort Mackay First Nation, which is where most of the open pit mining extraction is. And when I drove sort of, there's like a hill and you go over and suddenly you could see this great expansiveness of the extraction zone. And people have compared it to what looks like Mordor from Lord of the Rings. And I, I actually think that's an apt description. But for me, what I experienced was not just simply being shock and awe, but what I experienced was horror. And it was a horror that was deeply embedded in my identity. And even thinking about it now makes me deeply emotional because it was like seeing my relatives, my relations splayed out their dead body, just laying on the side of the road. I remember sitting in the back of the vehicle that my auntie was driving and seeing it. And I was just like, oh my God, it's so big. And she just starts talking because she's been desensitized to this. And suddenly 
I'm sitting here and I can't breathe. Like I'm literally holding my breath. It feels like there's someone sitting on my chest. My ears started ringing and I just started sobbing. That is violence. That is violence. And so when our community stand up and they they raise arms like they did in Oka, in Ganawage, in 1990 and 1991, Gustafsson Lake, all of the violent occupations of indigenous lands and territories, that is because we had experienced decades and centuries of colonial violence to our land, territories, and our people. The children being ripped out of our homes was violence. So when did the violence begin and who gets to determine when violence is, becomes punitive and who gets to have those punitive measures is a really important question because we become criminalized when we stand up for our lands and territories, when we hold blockades, when we hold demonstrations, when we protest, but that is not the violence. We're not the ones perpetuating violence. We are responding to the colonial violence that has been placed on our communities for decades. Sometimes it is necessary. Sometimes it is unavoidable. Sometimes we have to, but we also have to do it with those that are at the front of it. And it requires us also to acknowledge that trauma needs to be dealt with. This is not simply about being reactive and inflicting violence because of violence. We also have to deal with trauma. We have to do a, have a healing process in our own communities. But sometimes even then when we've healed, when we've done our journeys, the colonial violence continues. And that's when we start to see people stand up. So it needs to be contextualized because I find that question is very tricky. Um, and we also can't just be like, sometimes we just have to have violence because sometimes we see movements where anarchists are just smashing windows and doing things. And there is a place for that sometimes. But for the, for the most part, we have to be very strategic. These are tactics and strategies, not the solutions to the problem. And that there are much bigger issues and that we need to deal with that are systemic, that we have to unpack and reduce and mitigate those impacts of violence at the colonial level, not always by using violence against the colonial systems. Thanks for that, Ariel. Um, I'm going to put this next question out to both of you. I know a lot of folks who are concerned that we don't have time, you know, back to what you said, Professor Chomsky, um, with regards to the climate crisis, it's time to panic now. What do you both think is the most important thing we can do by ourselves, the time to get all the way to decolonization and climate justice? Can you give us guidance on the most effective day-to-day -day tools that we can use individually to combat climate change? There are things we can do individually. I live in Arizona, sun's shining all the time. We've got solar panels on the roof. You look around for miles and miles, no solar panels, just people complaining about thousand dollar a month electric bills. Uh, well, that's one thing you can do. You can uh, move to a more to a plant based diet. A lot of advantages to that, not only global warming. Uh, you can uh, lots of things you can do on an individual level. Fact of the matter is, they're good to do, but they don't do much. Anything that's needed has got to be at a national and international level. That's where the major changes have to be. There have to be major changes and that can be done. As we've seen, there are resolutions both in Canada and the United States for some form of Green New Deal. That's essential for survival. So pressure all the political system private institutions, make them face reputational risk, force them to move quickly to implement these feasible programs. That's what has to be done at every level you can. De-investing pension funds, pounding on the doors of your neighbors to get them to vote for somebody who'll decide to save the planet. 
all of these things can be done. What about you, Ariel? I think that that's a, that's a tough, tough question. I think uh, Professor Chomsky sort of hit the nail on the head. There's, we can take steps individually, but they don't have a ton of the, the impact because the reality is it's, it's corporations, it's the military industrial complex that are creating most of the emissions. And they've locked us into ransom economies that force us into these systems by demanding systemic change, whether it's by demanding that renewable energy is more accessible, by demanding that the, the labor move, by demanding that jobs and justice are hand in hand, that's where transformative change comes from. By demanding decolonization, by demanding these things, we can move forward. But I think we also do need to have shifts in, in the way we move forward because an energy transition at the way, rate in which we are consuming energy is also not sustainable. We also have to think about the, the rate in which like lithium batteries are being produced and the impact it has on communities in the global south. We have to think about the equality uh, of and the, the unequal distribution of bearing the consequences of the extractivism and capitalist economy systems. And so therefore we have to demand more, but we also have to take a look at ourselves and how we are also contributing and complicit in these systems continuing to perpetuate. And by doing the things that Noam, that Noam, Noam talked about, whether that's changing our diet, putting solar panels, driving less, but reducing our reliance on these systems is part of it and demanding a new system and transformation is going to be critical. And we have to do it quickly because we are running out of time. The, the house is burning um, and we have to move and we have to be strategic, but we also need to be humble because there's one thing that as an indigenous person is that the land teaches us everything, but we have to be willing to listen. So we need to have some humility and know that we don't have all of the answers right now, but we need to demand change. We need to move towards that change together as a collective. And so I honestly believe that some of the answers that we're searching for will come when we reconnect ourselves with the natural world and are able to listen to those things again. As a child, my dad taught me to listen and listen in a way that's very different. It was listening to nothing. When we would be out tracking animals, I would be yammering on and my dad would go, shh, listen. And I'd be walking in silence and I'd be like, listening to what? And then finally it clicks. You're listening to the wind. You're listening to the way the snow crunches in your feet. You're listening to the sounds in the forest and you're listening to a whole other language that many of us have forgotten. And if we learn to have some humility to learn that that language of the land is so critical and important to driving us to the future that we ask for, we will get there. An elder once said, we have two ears and one mouth for a reason because we need to listen twice as much as we speak. Absolutely incredible. Thank you so much for that response. Michelle, any closing thoughts, comments? It's been a pretty interesting full night. Wow. Uh, yeah, you know what, Janice? Um, I don't think I'm going to go to sleep too quick tonight. There's just <laughs> been so much dialogue, so much interest in, in what has been said. Um, um, yeah, it, it's going to be a tough night for me to fall asleep. Uh, I really, really appreciate the the words that have been spoken by Professor Chomsky and from you, Ariel. Um, it, it's just, it's warmed my heart. Um, it scared me. I'm scared. What you have said is is scary times for, for our future, future generations that are coming behind us. Um, so I want to thank you both for what for your contributions for the the, the knowledge you've uh, shared with us tonight. It's, it was fabulous, um, and um, I don't know. I'm I'm just um, flabbergasted, Janice. I'm, I'm I don't know how tomorrow can be tonight. So uh, over to you. I'll let you uh, say some closing comments, and and then we'll we'll shut her down and and be back tomorrow. <laughs>
I'm exactly with you. I don't know how I've got pages and pages of notes um, and thoughts running through my mind uh, and can hardly wait uh, for the conversations that are going to happen tonight and want to thank uh, Professor Chomsky and Ariel for doing that, for setting us in the right frame, uh, for putting all of those thoughts in our minds that we can unpack and work through uh, over the next couple of days. It started off when uh, Professor Chomsky said, you know, it's time to panic. And I thought, haha, I am panicking, but I found hope uh, in the comments that were made also when I kept hearing it coming back to workers have power. And so I think that now it's going to be really important for us tomorrow to harness that power and to figure out uh, how to move forward and how to deal with this uh, climate crisis in the way that we need to deal with it. Um, so I'm very excited. Uh, I'm like uh, Michelle, I'm not going to be sleeping all night. And I think this is going to be running through my mind. Uh, but we are hoping that we'll see you all back tomorrow morning um, at 10am for another great session of uh, presentations and guest speakers and incredible uh, panel discussion. Uh, and we need to thank most definitely our interpreters and our captioners. Uh, they do a great job of making sure that everybody has access uh, and uh, that the event is uh, accessible to everybody. Um, and then I have to send out a special thank you. Uh, and my heart just swells when I have to thank the pension uh, panel subcommittee, Kevin Skerritt, uh, Laura Bronwell, and Murray Gold um, for working with the OFL to help produce this conference. Uh, they said it could be done. Uh, we're doing, I can't believe that we've had this incredible night and it's thanks to those three individuals. Um, so I wanna say, uh, have a good night to everybody. See you tomorrow and such great fun co-hosting with you, Michelle. I hope you do get some sleep and we'll see you in the morning. Good night, everybody. Thank you, Joe. Good night. Thank you. Good night.